Got it. All right. So we're recording. Um, it is August 22nd as we're recording this. And um, this is episode 18 of the Make Guitar Podcast. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, how you doing, Mitch? I'm doing pretty good, Kirk. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Nice. What are you up to today? Um, well, I got to start work tomorrow. So I was just, I was actually working all weekend, like, which is, you know, mm. but uh, I tried to get onto some projects that I hadn't quite finished. So I had this, uh, this fuzz factory that I was working on. So I got this out and I actually got it all boxed up and put everything inside and it worked. It didn't work the first time, but then I figured out that I made a mistake and I fixed it and then it worked. And then I, I, work. and then I got this, I made this um big muff it's just a it's just like a, a big muff i used like a mad bean board and so i got this all put together i just got to wire it up inside the box and put the put the lid on and then it'll be done so like i did that today i got this i worked on it yesterday a little bit and then i wired it up today um and debugged it today so i got the fuzz working i'm going to do the muff later maybe cool i like that red box um it's, it's different from your usual thing yeah, yeah, I like this one too. It kind of came out good. Um, I I did the other fuzz like this, like this is another big muff right here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I did two in black, and then I used these kind of. I don't know if you can see them there. They're kind of like these, like they look like the knobs off the rat, but they're s s like smaller diameter. Mm -hmm. so I kind of like these knobs, but I also like these knobs. They're similar, but they have like a little aluminum cap, you know? Um, and I didn't have enough of these left over. So I, I had to use these other ones on this. That looks good. Yeah, thanks. It's sort of like the anti, well, it's, it's the reverse, you know? Yeah, yeah, the color scheme is kind of flipped. Yeah. yeah, we should, we got to do it. The episode on like, you know, branding and design and like, you know, what is, what is your, you know, your vision look like, you know, how do you translate that? You know, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's important. I mean, when you look down on your pedal board, like, um, what, what clues you in as to, you know, what pedal is, is what? Obviously, you get used to, you know, the position of each pedal on your pedal board. But if you switch it around all the time, um, that's, you know, that's definitely a factor. Yeah, I was I was also thinking on the lines of like as a product, like if you sell a range of products, like what do they look like, you know? Well, right. Yeah. But the end user is going to have that thought, like they're going to want to a pedal that looks like what it is. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully I, I get someone that wants all their pedals to look like this, and then I make them all look like that. You know? Right. Well, you know, there's probably somebody out there who likes all orange boss style pedals <laughs> that do different things. Yeah, I me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. I I'm kind of regretting that in some ways. Not really, but you know, just a little bit. It seems kind of now I'm thinking, ah, maybe that was a silly thing to do. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's not um unheard of that um that that JHS pedal pack, it's like all white pedals with black text on them. Yeah. Um you would have to know your pedal board, you know, if you if you used a pedal board entirely made up of those pedals. Oh yeah, good point. Good point. So maybe all if I make all my pedals black like this, maybe it's not a good thing. I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, I I'm gonna make a pedal board that's all aluminum, and then the pedal board's gonna be, you know, brown leather like um, like Chewy's uh, bandolier. Oh, so that's another one. Yeah, we got to do the pedal board episode where we each do the pedal board. So that's coming up, and then we got to do a design episode. Yeah. You know. Right. right. Yeah. I don't know if I have enough pedals to do that, that pedal board yet, but um, I'm working on my, um, uh, my regular pedal board, the, the commercial pedal board. So um, still not totally dialed in. Um, 
I'll just just put this out there. Like if if you have a one spot or something similar, um, and say you have nine pedals that you want to use, then how do you power that ninth pedal? If that one spot has eight things on it, and you've got one more. Oh so, yeah. Yeah, I just started looking into that. They have ones with 10. Um, like I have a, a daisy chain for for 10 pedals. So um, I'm gonna try one of those out. Yeah. Here's a couple of weird ideas that I had. Um, one was to make a battery powered pedal board. So hmm. it would have, cause you can get those kind of like laptop batteries. You know, it's kind of flat, maybe they're square. You can get them various sizes. I have one, it's about like this big and it's maybe like half inch, inch thick, you know? Um, but I thought like that would be kind of cool. You could put it under the pedal board and then anytime you went somewhere, you wouldn't have to look for an outlet. <laughs> I like that idea. Like um, everything in and go, you know? Yeah. I mean, it would suck if your, your pedal board caught on fire because that sometimes <laughs> happens with those rechargeable laptop batteries. Yeah. Or those. Yeah, well, um, well, you know, I got that laptop battery because I, I got it to power the Euro rack. So I could take the Euro rack. I have a small Euro rack case. It's it's a 62 HP. So it's like, you know, it's about this big, you know, maybe like this, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's a little it's about the size of a laptop, maybe a little smaller, you know, a little thicker though, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I got that because I can power that with the battery. So you could take it outside, you know, and plug the headphones in, you know. That's cool. So yeah, you could walk around uh, the park, you know, blasting Euro rack music. <laughs> I mean, well, I'd be, I'd be blasting it in my headphones, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could be turning on. Actually, you could do it while you're walking. That would be kind of interesting. I was thinking you could just sit on a bench or take it to the beach or something, you know? Yeah. I actually worked on a blog post about the battery powered your rack. Oh, cool. Well, um, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that. I like the idea of a battery powered um, pedal board also, because, you know, like it's, it's easy enough to have um, like a a busking amp that's better battery powered and to put batteries in your pedals, but like to actually have like an array of, of pedals. Um, and, you know, maybe some that don't have a, a place for a battery, like mini pedals or something like that. It'd be kind of cool to have just put them on a pedal board. Yeah, you could probably power a small amp with the um with the battery pack too oh sure yeah you know because you can make a um you could make like a half watt amp with this chip called the 386 mm -hmm. the 386 chip it makes great some distortion boxes too they use it in all sorts of distortion boxes um i want to do a blog post on that as part of the class so that's like I, i'm planning that for like class number four but uh, but you you basically the thing turn you can use it as a half watt amp, and it runs on nine volts, right? So it's just like a guitar pedal. Okay. But you could power a half watt like a speaker with a half watt of power. So if you had like a twelve inch speaker or something, it it can actually be pretty loud. It can put out a lot of a lot of volume enough to get you kicked out of your apartment or have people banging on the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or maybe um, enough to. Uh hear over a guy playing a bucket or something like that on market street <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know if i can compete with the bucket guy he's pretty good <laughs> yeah and he's pretty loud too he he's got some good. pots and pans in addition to that bucket yeah 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 he's pretty good you know i guess there's more than one bucket guy so you know yeah yeah well there's that pretty much that like the the crossroads of of market street like fifth and market that seems to be like where all the 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 busking kind of centers oh yeah yeah or even fourth you know down by um by the old navy yeah yeah that that's that's the place yeah that in stockton right like right there yeah pretty buskable <laughs> yeah. though, though the fifth and market is right by the bart station right so that's pretty pretty busky you know yeah you know, yeah the, 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 there's the um there's this band um by the uh it used to be the apple store um so that's uh stockton and, and market 
Yeah. And um, they've started showing up again. I think they're called like the backyard party band or something. They have the really generic name, but they're super good. They're, um, they're very professional and that their vocalist has an amazing range. Um, yeah, if you, if you ever get back downtown um, on a, say, uh, Wednesday afternoon, um, check out the Backyard Party Band. Yeah, cool. I'll have to check them out. Maybe they're, they probably have a YouTube channel, right? They probably do. I've never looked for them. I mean, it's also like such a generic name. It might even be hard to find them. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. I think they probably bring like a generator on a, you know, pickup truck or they, have, you know, have like a car battery or something like that that fuels their, their amps and their PA because they're, they're really loud. I mean, they're loud enough to, you know, to play with, with the drums and everything. So, yeah, that's kind of funny, actually, that you can just go out on the street and just make as much noise as you want until someone complains, I guess. But right. You know, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm not asking these people for permits or anything like that. But they, yeah, yeah, people are downtown like rocking out pretty loud. But like, if you did it at your house, like your neighbors would complain. But downtown, yeah. I've seen people like drag, like set up a drum set at, at Union Square. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a guy that sets up the drum set at Union Square. And he's just sitting at like Powell and Post and just like rocking out on his drums. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah yeah i mean i wonder if that guy has a permit probably not but it might just yeah. be one of those things they're not enforcing yeah you know right and then like the the joke is we there's a, a cut scene that goes to city hall and there's a bunch of drummers they all have their sticks out they're just like tapping in line they're waiting for their permit you know, <laughs> you know? yeah so uh let's see hey let's uh should we talk about about uh something else did you did you, did you watch uh um forbidden planet i did yes um Would you yeah think? so um uh, yeah amazing movie um but an even more amazing soundtrack um which was uh entirely electronic um highly recommend that you all check out the uh, the music of Luis and babe baron uh, and check out the movie while you're at it. It's pretty, pretty cool. You, you, I think you mentioned the, uh, the animators were borrowed from Disney, uh, but it's a live action film from what, 1956. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's um, totally amazing. Yeah. And then, and then the whole soundtrack, like the music and the sound effects are all electronic. And then, you know, it's 1956. So the Barons, um, were hired to do the music. They they just did it, the two of them, and they did it all with um, kind of homemade equipment and test equipment. So imagine electronic devices that are not musical instruments, but they just generate like sine waves or some kind of, you know, they modify, you know, signals going into them. Like they used a ring modulator, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but it wasn't like a musical tool. It was like you know, electronic lab equipment, you know, and then they added some reverb and delay and stuff, but uh, totally amazing. And then the thing about it is, I don't know that anybody nowadays would take a chance on a, a soundtrack that was so weird as the soundtrack in Forbidden Planet. I, I would agree with that. I don't think that, I mean, there was no music like this this the soundtrack at the at the time um i mean it's uh yeah i mean it was really really pioneering um nowadays you know it's like if you have a movie like a like the tron movie um even the the soundtrack to tron the 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 newer the reboot um had like a little bit of daft punk and then a um, there was like a guy who does, I think he did the Batman soundtrack, like really kind of like common, common movies. So they, they needed to, uh, I guess, make it a little more safe. Um, yeah. Yeah. They don't so. want to go out on a limb. People might not like it, you know, or like, it's not what they expect or, you know, they're trying to like, or it doesn't sound like this other movie, you know, I feel like with Forbidden Planet, 
the the barons got a kind of a, a you know free pass to do whatever they wanted to do, right? And the the producers were okay with it. Where I think nowadays people would be a lot more I don't know careful about about the music they chose because there wasn't one bit of regular music, and none of the sounds are even like standard musical so they don't use like you know standard western scales or it's not even tuned to anything it's just all <laughs> it's totally <laughs> out there it's super good though like yeah it's amazing you know yeah i i, I like that it's like it it kind of serves two purposes in the movie I, I mean maybe more purposes but like um the first time that i became aware of the soundtrack while watching the movie was before they even land on the planet while they're on the ship and they're preparing to land or preparing to like leave light speed or whatever. And um, they use that, you know, the same techniques to create kind of like the sound of the inside of the ship. Um, and, you know, I'd have to go back and listen to it again, but, you know, I, it probably differs from the sounds of the Krell once they actually are on the, on the planet yeah yeah i'd say like you know what they did is they essentially like transported the the viewers into the future and to another planet through the audio so the audio yeah. sounds completely alien and it's all electronic so at in 1956 that was very futuristic so basically the audio took us on this journey and like pulled us away from earth and took us like 2000 years in the future and, you know, 200,000 light years away, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, yeah. Sorry. I was just taking a look at the, um, the, the titles for the pieces because they do have, you know, different themes like, um, the landing and once around Altair, which is the name of the planet. Um, so those must be the those pieces that I was talking about. And then it goes into ancient Krell music, you know. There, so there, there's a you know, different themes um, that have different different sounds. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. The Krell are super cool. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna plug my my videos now. <laughs> like, so. One of the things, like if you're into the Eurorack stuff, there's sort of a, a thing of making a Krell patch, which is, it's basically, you know, you patch up your synthesizer to sound like the Krell music from Forbidden Planet, mm -hmm. right? And it's like a common thing. So you can find threads on Mod Wiggler about this or lines, you know, like people do it all the time. And it's kind of a fun patch to try and recreate, you know? Um, but you know what I did the other day was I made a couple, um, a little bit of Krell music just using guitar pedals and I posted them to YouTube and I thought it'd be fun to see if I could get other people to try and make a Krell patch with guitar pedals right? and just tag it like music of the Krell. Music of the Krell. Yeah. Make sure you use, you tag it music of the Krell because um, mm -hmm. you've already got several pieces uh, out on, the, on our channel yeah because it was fun i just had the pedals so i just was like what do i need i need like a an oscillator i need or something to generate a note and then i need like some reverb some delay or different you know like i used i had a ring ring modulator pedal so i used that too because that was very krell patch mm -hmm. you know you know back in the day i made a, a patch for this app uh bbot oh nice <laughs> It doesn't sound like that, but I, I lost it when, you know, I upgraded my phone, of course. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it, this on this app, I don't know if people know about this app, but it's, um, um, you, you can adjust the pitch by going left to right and modulation by going up and down. And then you can put effects on it like echo. And so if you don't have a guitar, you don't have guitar effects, you don't have a synthesizer, you can download this, this app and, um, and make your own music from music of the Krell. 
Um, with the app. Oh, that's funny. You could do it on the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You could do it at, at Fifth and Market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you had a, some kind of a speaker. Um, yeah. You could see how much uh, how much you can make busking with music of, of the Krell. <laughs> yeah, Krell music. I wonder if that would work, you know. That's super funny. Yeah, we should do that. It's just totally alien music on Market Street. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never seen that done. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be the first. Yeah. Maybe the last, who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe there's a reason that it doesn't happen. Yeah, maybe. You know, wrong planet, you know? Yeah. And on, on, on Altair, it might have been really popular. Right. Yeah, probably probably back in the day when you know, like before all of the uh, the inhabitants were you know disintegrated or whatever. Yeah, you know, you know what I did was I used this fuzz factory, so I made the fuzz factory, and the fuzz factory will oscillate if you turn the knobs a certain way, right? Usually, if you turn the stability down, it'll start oscillating. Sometimes, if you just turn this down, and then if you play with the with the comp and the gate like it'll start oscillating or you can even change the pitch of it by turning the knob or adjusting the volume on the guitar. So, so I did that on a couple patches. Like I just tuned the, the fuzz factory to get some oscillation. And then I ran that through a pedal, you know, or through a couple pedals. Very cool. Yeah. We're going to post links to those videos to, uh, in the description of yeah. this video. So check yeah, them out. Yeah. Yeah, I also use the the ugly face. So I call oh, this of course. frequency, but I use the ugly face because this also oscillates. So if you turn the if you turn the threshold, this is I, I I'm working on this one, but like if you turn the threshold down, it starts oscillating. You know. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because it's a it's a really you know it's a very far out, spaced out sounding uh, fuzz. Yeah, that one's great. I love that pedal. It's like one of my favorite pedals. I mean, you can't use it all the time. Like it's one of those ones that's got, it's like, it's got a really strong uh, flavors. You know? like, yeah. yeah. It's like a, a one, it's like one of those spices. It's not like salt and pepper. You can't put it on everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even our friend Dan has the same, same verdict and he's pretty yeah. weird. Yeah. It's not like hot sauce. You can just put it on everything. It's like, let me think what's a good spice. Like, can't put on everything. Um, all spice. Was, what? All spice. Yeah, or cloves. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, but yeah, I think it's cool. I, I like it. You know, I found this one. This one was kind of like half finished, so I was like, I should just finish this up. It just needs some knobs. I think for some reason I didn't finish it because maybe it's not. There's something broken inside. I gotta fix it. So I gotta plug that in and figure out what's wrong with it. You know. Yeah. So um, what else about the, the, the Forbidden Planet? Oh, yeah, you know, I was going to point out that I feel like Forbidden Planet, it was like I read somewhere it was a huge influence on Gene Roddenberry. Hmm. So it really inspired him, you know, before he wrote Star Trek, right? And I, I can see that in the movie because the, like the, the, crew of the starship is like they, they have a uniform on it kind of looks not a lot but a little bit like like the star trek uniforms and then they have these blasters but it kind of reminds you of the phaser a little bit and there's a character in there alta who is the daughter of of dr morbius right and um she's only she's only lived on the planet altair right so she was born there and so she hasn't been to earth and so she's very logical and so I, there's a couple scenes in in the movie where like this guy is trying to hit on her and he's trying to teach her to kiss you know and he's like oh i'll show you how it's done you know and so she kisses him and then she stops a minute and she thinks about it and she's he's like did you feel something and she's like no <laughs> <You know? laughs> and i kind of wonder if in a in a small way if that inspired um the vulcans and spock you know, because she's a little she's super logical, but she's pretty logical, like the way that she approaches. Right. And she's a completely human being. Um, yeah. But yeah, yet she is, you know, she doesn't have that experience with, uh, you know, like irony or, you know, sarcasm or even, you know, like uh, kind of like dating and, and all of that crazy energy. So yeah, I would, I would, I would bet on it. 
it was a very influential movie in a lot of ways. Um, it was a commercial success. It wasn't, it's not like some underground movie it had a, um, you know, healthy budget that, um, I mean, it's, it, it's, it shows up in like the costumes, the, the environment, the, the robot, um, Robbie, right? Robbie, the robot. He's a, yeah. I think most people are aware of this, this film because of, of Robbie, the robot. Like he's a very like iconic visual presence. Um, yeah, they, they said the, uh, the robot was, I forget like $125,000 to construct, but back in 1956, that was a third of the budget. So they said if it was nowadays, it would have been like a million dollars. You know, imagine the movie costs like $3 million and they spent a million dollars just on the robot. That's One crazy. Robot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they said the robot, they had an actor that played the robot and essentially you have to wear this suit and it weighs like a hundred pounds. So like, and he was a little person. No, no, I think it was like a normal sized person. Okay. Put you in the suit and it, and it rests on your shoulders. Like you wear a harness and it's kind of like you're holding up a hundred pounds of stuff, you know? So they said it was really tiring on the, uh, on the actor. And then they said that the, the first guy that played the robot it apparently had like an alcohol problem and he almost fell over in the robot suit. You know, <laughs> like they didn't say specifically that he was drinking, but they did mention he had some trouble with alcohol but uh so they fired him and they got somebody else so that so just note to everybody out there you want to be famous robot actor you know don't hit the sauce when you're in the suit mm -hmm. and if you do make sure you can hold the, your liquor <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to encourage any bad behavior yeah no no we don't um also, it's not very robotic to be swaying and, you know, stumbling. <laughs> yeah, I saw a video on YouTube. I looked up Robbie the Robot, and there's a guy that, I don't know, I guess he owns the original robot, and mm. he showed it off. He said, oh, yeah, here's the robot. You know, and he kind of showed it, and another guy was interviewing him, and it kind of was, what was weird is it looked like they just had the robot in his living room, right? And it had this control panel that was like the size of a small desk with a bunch of, like, big toggle switches on it, right? And so I guess they controlled the robot from this, this control panel. So they'd hit a button and the things, they'd have these like spinning things on its head, right? And these little like kind of hammers and things that look like, I don't know, like relay switches in an old telephone company or something, right? Mm -hmm. You could turn those on and activate them from, the, uh, from this control panel. That'd be a cool prop to have. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's worth a bundle, like, because mm -hmm. it's so iconic and historical, and there's only one, you know, so yeah. sure I paid a lot of money for it at some kind of auction or something, right? I don't know. Right. Yeah, prior to that, I think, you know, most robots were, you know, like, guys with, like, a tinfoil suit or, like, a garbage can on his head or something like that. So this was really, you know, this was really um, forward-looking uh, of the, you know, production designers to create this this kind of a prop yeah yeah they even had like a little car that was like he was integrated into the little car yeah he drove the vehicle yeah yeah it was like a little i don't know like a little pickup space pickup truck <laughs> he picked mm -hmm. up the crew from the from the ship you know yeah um the guy that made the robot he went on and made the robot for lost in space too which is why they look kind of similar they're not yeah. exactly the same but they're they're similar they share some qualities yeah i was going to say that it, it was clearly you know the the lost in space robot which is probably like maybe the most well-known robot from from that time um was definitely inspired by robbie the robot um well, the, the the robot in lost in space he was just called the robot or or what did he have a name i think they just called him robot yeah okay yeah, because yeah, I think when I was a kid, I thought he was, I thought he was Robbie, and I don't think I had seen Lost in, or uh, Forbidden Planet. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good movie. It's a great, really mm -hmm. amazing soundtrack. Totally weird out there. Like, I mean, yeah. like they did the soundtrack in 1956. So, like, 
uh, Robert Moog makes the Moog synthesizer in like 1964, somewhere around 64. So it's like, it takes them eight years. It's like eight years later and Robert Moog makes an actual synthesizer. And so before that, like the Barons were just, you know, they don't, you couldn't just go buy a Casio or buy an Oberheim or a Moog, you know, so they were just like taking equipment and turning it on. And it's kind of similar to Delia Derbyshire who was making music just with sounds and recording it, but the, the Barons, um, like rather than like where 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 Delia was making tape loops, kind of like she was doing early sampling, right, and modifying these samples of real world sounds. Like she'd hit like a lampshade or something to get a sound, or blow on some bottles to get the tones. The Barons use this electronic equipment, so the you know the sounds all came from some device and were generated electronically. You know. So it's kind of cool. It was very similar, but um, to what Derbyshire was doing, but also like very different, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Delia had access to some of the same kinds of equipment, like tone generators that that she would then sample yeah. and then make it into a, a loop. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure she used some of that. I, I just feel like her music didn't focus on that where the Barons did, Right. you know, Yeah. right? I just remember that movie where they were. She had the lampshade, and she's like, "This was like my favorite, <laughs> my favorite <laughs> sample, right?" And she'd like bang on it and then slow it down or speed it up or, you know, slice it, you know, on tape, you know, right? And she had that piece that was all doorbells, you know, mm. knock people knocking on doors and ringing the doorbell, you know. Yeah, she really went off on themes. Um, yeah, you know, like those, you know, the the, the dreams where it's the voiceover and these repeating phrases and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, where the, the Forbidden Planet doesn't have anything like that. Right. Yeah, so it's completely ambient music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's crazy. Yeah, it's super, it's super good, super inspiring, you know. And it, it would be great to have on just, you know, um, while reading or, or working. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> doing the dishes. Um, you worried to me. <laughs> I can't imitate it. It's so weird. <laughs> you know, yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be good. You know, I used to have the soundtrack on CD and then I sold it like an idiot, but you know. Well, fortunately you, uh, you made me a copy of it. So I, I ripped oh, did it. I copy it my, yeah. I've got an MP3 copy of it. I think I sent it to you before we, uh, um, recorded the first draft of this video. Oh, okay. Oh, great. I'll send it to you again. I might be just, on uh, I my Dropbox. Yeah, I just watched the movie again and listened to it in the movie, you know. Cool. Hey, let me ask you, now let's get into some music. What kind of music were you listening to this week? Did you hear anything great? Um, well, uh, I had a chance to listen to um, uh, Angel Olsen's, I think it's an EP or it's a it's a short LP or whatever, but it's a uh, uh, it's called Isles, and it's all covers. It's all '80s covers. It's a really weird thing from from Angel Olsen. Um, and it, I mean, aside from the the selection of music, uh, I mean, she's not really known for her covers. But aside from her her selection of music, it just has a very weird kind of space age vibe to it. Um, I think I have to hear this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, she does um, it's like I'm all uh, there. <laughs> does, does she, do, she does like a safety dance or no? She does. Um, I had this thing up. Oh, um, I just heard that in the car the other day. Safety dance. Yeah. That was another one where I like. We got to ask Steve about this, right? Because I think he grew up in in England, right? And. Like, I think that's like another song, like it came out in the eighties and it's kind of decidedly like, it's got a very electronic vibe to it, you know? Oh, yeah. Where like in the States, like everybody was rocking out to their hair metal, you know? So there was this split, like this, like in the sixties, like sixties UK and sixties United States were like all this garage rock, you know, and it was very similar, right? But then like, you know, then there was a split where the UK went in this weird, like, you know, electronic direction, you know, where the United States, everybody put on their Spantex and cranked up their Marshalls, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there was, um, you know, there, there was the cars and um, oh yeah, a lot of talking heads. Um, but yeah, for the most part, everybody was into that, you know, the hair metal thing. Um, I mean, I was I was into like new wave music in high school, um, but of course, I was I was well versed in you know Motley Crue and yeah, you know, White Snake and things like that as well. I mean, the Scorpions, uh, you know, that's a European band that was totally into that kind of like anthemic um, kind of hair metal. Even though like Klaus Mina is a little hair challenged, um, yeah. they were still kind of in that category of hair metal oh yeah and who's that uh what's that band um oh Def Leppard was another that yeah was, that was an English band yeah that's what I was just gonna say Def Leppard is like huge right you know so yeah. they, had, they had their share of metal but you know I just feel like there was a lot of like electronic stuff going on over there you know oh yeah I mean you had like Human League the Human League that was a big yeah. kind of like left turn I mean that's what kind of like comes out of the you know like that Gary Newman fork oh yeah 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 craft work and you know mm -hmm. stuff a lot of drum machines you know yeah I feel like and i feel like that kind of led to like this dj scene where you know because you could have a drum machine and people could be dancing all night because you know right the machine just goes forever you know like you know right you know, right and i feel like they were doing that kind of weird rave parties and stuff and house music and stuff was like house music was kind of underground here but like in the uk it seemed like it was maybe more popular you know i don't know though oh, I, I think so i mean there was this movie uh 24 hour party people about factory records um they're outstanding you know it's kind of like a um it, well it's it's historical fiction but it's um it's been kind of like made into a a, a comedy a little bit um steve coogan plays the um i can't remember his name the guy who founded the the company um but um for those who don't know factory records is where um joy division and um, um new order uh were produced and um happy mondays um no, I, I I can't think of all the the bands that came from Factory Records, but it, you know it's a very cool uh, you know sort of employee owned like everyone who who had a record on on Factory was a a part owner of Factory Records. Oh, cool! I like that. We need more of that. Yeah, totally. No. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was very successful, especially since you you know like bands like Happy Mondays. You know, they were like the original My Bloody Valentine. You know, they they took their advance and like went to, you know, Tahiti or something like that and partied and did drugs and eventually came back with their second album. But yeah, they spent a lot of money um, not doing much. Yeah, I guess it's rough being a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably rougher being a uh, like a um, a record company. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, at the beginning, then you get to a certain level where you just like have a bunch of you know all of the rec uh, the the bands that are working for you are there are your your servants. Yeah, who's that? You know, that Jack White guy. He has like Third Man Records. Mm -hmm. I saw something where they were doing like he'd have a concert, like he'd be put on a show. And then they record it and press a record like right afterwards, or at least that's what it looked like they were doing. And so you could just go to the show and then buy the record, buy the vinyl. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it was super cool. You know, he kind of annoys me sometimes, but then sometimes he does really cool shit. Like, you know, he'll come up with a great riff and then, and then I'll see a picture and I'll be like, God, dude, I can't, I cannot stand your hair. You know, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like your hair is really bugging me, you know, like, but then he'll like, he'll, like play like an awesome like he's like as a performer he's like very good like he oh just, yeah he totally owns the stage and like some performances are better than others obviously but you know he can he can totally stand up there with the best of them and then other oh, times absolutely. like you have poor taste in clothes you know like yeah well i mean there's the image stuff but it's also you know like i've seen him a couple times i saw the white stripes and i saw the um the dead weather and um both times like the performances are great you know the songs are cool and then 
between songs, he'll do some stupid banter. And you just like, you just want him to shut up and play the music. Okay. So, and I've said this before, it's going to be controversial. I really don't want to hurt, you know, JW's feelings or anything. Right. But I like, I I'm, it's like, I'm most of the time I'm like loving the guy. Like I saw this little clip from like, it might get loud where he's just like, yeah, you know, you can just make rock and roll with a guitar string and, and a, a guitar pickup. And he just like takes the string and wires it between two nails and then like plays a slide guitar through a mm -hmm. big muff, you know? And it's like amazing. Right. I'm just like, the guy is a musical kind of genius, you know, you see him, but then he starts talking and I'm just like, Oh dude, just shut up. <laughs> like you're just like, sound like a you're just really annoying me you just sound like kind of a jerk you know like mm -hmm. you know what I mean like and I know it's I mean I probably come across that way in some circumstances too if not more but you know it's like I don't know sometimes sometimes like there's there's a point where you just got to shut your trap mm -hmm. I think he hasn't mastered that yet you know one day he's maybe he'll get that and then it'll be like it'll be good for him yeah but you know it's like as far as I'm aware of he does not have a youtube channel where he like talks to the public so maybe he does he's aware of that on some level he should be on our show yeah. <laughs> you know but yeah i gotta i gotta give him props for some things like i mean i think the white stripes are pretty genius they got a lot of really great music the guy he plays great guitar comes up with some amazing riffs the whole idea of third man records i mean obviously it's a like he's probably not making a lot of money off that. So I think that's kind of actually cool. Like, you know, mm -hmm. right. But, and then he's just following his dream of making vinyl, you know, and the idea of, you know, yeah. promoting weird acts, creating fuzz pedals and making vinyl records, like is cool. Like I gotta, I gotta give him props for that stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of the stuff on third man, um, on their shop is kind of like a urban outfitters, you know, it's like all, like all the things you need to have if you want to be cool. Like, yeah. A little you bit. need to have like this fuzz pedal with like, um, like, uh, what do you call those things? Like telegraph switches oh, yeah. on top and, um, you know, like vinyl and record players and, you know, like those, those sleeves, like the, we were talking about this before the, um, um, uh, 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 the sleep, um, DJ record mat. Yeah. Like, it's not really like DJ music, but I guess if you like, you know, if you like sleep, why not have it have it on your your record player? Protect yeah. Your, protect, we're just waiting for the we're just waiting for the crossover act that's like the doom metal DJ scratch, you know. <laughs> scratch uh, doom metal. You know? you know, I could see that. Um Yeah, totally. You know, like Portis Head, um one it's not doom metal at all, but I'm you know, that's sort of a, well, that's, it's a traditional music act that has, you know, a drummer and a guitarist and a bassist, but it also has a guy who scratches records. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, who, who knows? Anything well, it can happen. Yeah, anything could happen, right? You know? Yeah. So, uh, where were we? We were, we were talking about what we're listening to. So you were listening. Oh, yeah. You're listening to um, Isles. Wait, who's that again? It's um, Angel Olsen. Angel and, Olsen. Yeah, she also does Eyes Without a Face. Is she if on you Bandcamp? Leave. Yeah, it's on uh, the whole. Um, awesome. The whole thing is on Bandcamp, and you can buy a cassette for seven dollars and ninety nine cents U.S. Yeah, I would buy a cassette, but I'm not going to buy. I don't even have a cassette player anymore. <laughs> I used to though. I used to have all my music on cassette. Right. I had a couple yeah. albums, but it was just like, you know, I didn't have a very good record player and records were more expensive. You could get cassettes that are easier to store. So when I was a kid, I just bought cassettes. Yeah. Or, you know, when I was a kid, I had a, a record player with a double cassette thing so I could record a oh, vinyl. Yeah. So I would just borrow records and make tapes. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, that was cool. I think nowadays nobody does that, but like making mixtapes was like really cool. Like I had a lot of really cool music that people gave me on tape, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was a great way to share music. That was, you know, before, you know, before the internet, before um, MP3s, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening. Actually, you know, here's kind of a, uh, I got, there's a dark side to the story, but I, I was listening to a band called The Chameleons. 
they're kind of like a post-punk kind of band, you know? Oh, it's uh, the Chameleons, also known as the Chameleons UK. Mm, I don't know. British band? Yeah, they're from Manchester. From like the kind of late 80s? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure, but they're, yeah, they're from, they're from the UK. They're from okay. Manchester and they're kind of a post-punk kind of band. You know, they sound a little like, I actually you know it's kind of funny is I kind of hear like a lot of like, like influence from a lot of things and i don't know if they were influencing other people or if they were influenced by you know but they sound a lot like a lot of stuff you heard in the 80s you know but they were kind of and they and they were kind of their own thing too but they were pretty good the dark side to this story though was um was that i i ran into them because of the algorithm on youtube so mm. I was listening i was listening to something and then they they showed me the chameleons which is kind of weird, you know, I'm like, I feel a little weird because I'd rather discover stuff on my own. But now having, you know, YouTube suggest stuff to me is kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of bugs me. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's pretty hard to get around that. That's just like the way yeah. all of these services work now, you know, whether it's, you know, Facebook or, you know, Twitter or um, YouTube, it, it, it always it shows you stuff that it thinks that you want to watch. And then sometimes the stuff is really weird. Like why does, why is it sending me stuff about like living in a van? Is it, <laughs> yeah. Does it know something of the, about what's going to happen to me? That I don't know. <laughs> it's like Kirk, you better get a van. You're going to need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I listened to that um, red lorry, yellow lorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. I listened to their album, talk about the weather. And then it suggested the chameleons for me, you know? Interesting. You know, I didn't listen to that. A little bit like, like, I don't know, U2 meets uh, Morrissey meets the Smiths meets the, like, I don't know, um, who else? Like uh, Flock of Seagulls or something, something, you know? It's really interesting that they're, that you refer to them as the chameleons, because I think that I'm pretty sure that that is the Chameleons UK. That was how you know people referred to them for um, you know for most of their career. And I'm thinking there must be some other band that was called the Chameleons. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the case because the, the just on on the on the video that I saw it just said the Chameleons. Yeah, maybe they just like they won the name. <laughs> maybe. I saw they suggested another video that was them playing in like 2019 or 2009, something like that. Okay. Like they did some kind of reunion, you know, I don't know. I didn't watch that though, but, uh, but I watched the, I, what was it? It was like, what was the album? I wrote it down. It was, um, let me look it up real quick here. It was, uh, what does anything mean question mark basically like <laughs> which is kind of a funny you know phrase you know it's like the album is like what does anything mean question mark and then basically basically a, not a dot 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 no is no it... but, so it's kind of weird where they put the question mark you know yeah right and then because you know because like you could ask the question basically and then put the question mark at the end which is weird too a little weird but the whole idea of putting basically on there sounds a little bit like a teenager like basically you know like like they know it all you know mm -hmm. so it kind of annoys me as a phrase but maybe like back in the 80s people saw it differently you know or or in england the phrase it comes across differently you know yeah no, it's interesting that you said that, that you saw something from them performing, you know, like in 2009 or 19 or whatever, because, you know, there are a lot of bands from that time period that um, maybe they have been, maybe they dissolved and have come back or, you know, maybe they've been, you know, like the it's weekend warriors or something like that in the intervening years, but they're kind of back now, like um, check out this. Okay. So this is a festival that's happening in Pasadena next year yeah um and it's called cruel world and um the headlining acts are morrissey and bauhaus 
Blondie, and Devo. Uh, and then Echo and the Bunnymen, the Psychedelic Furs, Violent Femmes, The Church, The English Beat, Public Image, The Damned. Um, and there's a whole bunch of bands that I, I'm not really familiar with, like Black Audio, where the, the C in Black has been replaced with a Q. Uh, and then one called TR slash ST, uh, Cold Cave, J. Aston's. Oh, I think that J. Aston's Gene Loves Jezebel must be what Gene Loves Jezebel is called now. Anyways, um, Berlin, Missing Persons, London After Midnight, Drab Majesty, 45 Grave, Christian Death, The Meteors, Black Marble, Sextile, Soft Kill, Automatic, The KF or KVB. Brookside at the Rose Bowl. Oh, no, Brookside at the Rose Bowl is not a band. That's where it is. So anyways, that's a huge list of bands that really, you know, they probably haven't been doing much since the, you know, the 80s. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, you know, Blondie, we know Blondie's kind of like come in it back and forth, uh, you know, out of retirement. Um, Devo again, you know, um, flirted with retirement, but they've kind of been around. They had um, an album. They came out with a new album like maybe five or seven years ago. Okay, okay. But then some of these bands are are new, but they're kind of in the vein, like uh, London After Midnight. Um, I know that's one of my coworkers listens to that, and Cold Cave. Those are some you know uh, contemporary bands that sound very much like. 80s goth music which is kind of what that that festival is about yeah i i would go see a show like that except i wouldn't i don't want to go in person <laughs> i don't want to go to pasadena yeah and i don't want to stand in line and like stand up in a crowded room full of people though i would go see all those bands i think i'll just wait and watch them all on youtube you know? <laughs> yeah yeah i think there's going to be a huge amount of of youtube content generated by this festival yeah for um, sure right also, I think this is um, I think this is a, a regular festival, so it probably happens every every couple of years or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I'll have to check that check into that, right? You yeah. Know? Hey, so uh, I got a question then. So, what are you working on? Do you got any projects you're working on? Uh, <laughs> I dug out all the parts for my base. I haven't gotten around to um, um, you know drawing up the the edits or, or drilling into it at all, but um, um, got all the parts out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get started on that this week. Um, yeah. Is the bridge, did you put the bridge on it? No, I haven't put the bridge on yet. Hmm. So, so that's like an interesting thing is like where you place the bridge it has to be accurate, right? Mm -hmm. And then where you put the pickup, like, you know, you want to place it like on, especially on the bass, like, you know, you know, essentially like when the string vibrates, like it can vibrate between two points. Mm -hmm. Right. But as you play up the neck, like the string kind of like, it'll like vibrate, like kind of like an S and you'll get these spots, like where it looks like this, where there's a node where it's not moving. And if the pickup is under that point, then it does, it's like where it sounds really quiet, you know, or if it's under a point where it's the widest point of the vibration it sounds loud you know mm -hmm. right so there's i remember reading something about people talking about like measuring the length and trying to divide it down into finding a position for the pickup that is not under one of these points you know yeah that's a really interesting um kind of conundrum i i've done some thinking about that and i was i was thinking i was going to base my measurements on the um the jazz bass. I'll just put it where they put the pickup on a jazz bass or or a P bass where they add that bridge pickup from like a jazz bass. Um, the other idea that I had was um, this idea of making a like a 51 style P bass with two pickups on it. It's been done before, obviously. And I've seen a bunch of instruments on um, on Pinterest they've they've kind of put the the bridge pickup sort of right right in the middle 
So it's not close to the bridge really at all. It's kind of like just a few inches away from the neck pickup. Um, so I, I might look into what that's about. Um, but they put the other like the neck pickup up really close to the neck. Well, on the 51 P base, it's kind of between where the like the neck heel ends and the bridge, like right in between, because it's got this big pick guard. Mm -hmm. um, it's like uh, it in the middle. Yeah, it's kind of like it seems like it's right in the middle. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I'm gonna have to do some kind of measurements and figure out where the the optimal place for it will be. But um, I think I'm gonna rather than you know like putting a string on it and measuring where the waveform is or whatever. Um, I'm going to base <laughs> base my measurements on an existing instrument. Yeah, that's probably a safe place to start, right? Yeah. So you're thinking about putting it in between the bridge and the current pickup or in between the neck and the current pickup? Um, no, no, I'm thinking about putting it between the, the neck pickup and the bridge. Yeah, OK. Yeah, and then so that'll be closer to the yeah, closer to the bridge or closer to the like in between. Yeah. I guess like besides like getting like a musically useful spot, right? Mm -hmm. There's also like this aesthetic thing, like you know, because if you put it in a weird spot, it could like the proportions could look kind of weird, right? Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I, I I've seen that like on on other instruments where people have tried the same thing. Um, you know, sometimes it wouldn't be my preference. Um, like it's just kind of arbitrarily like in the middle of the of the body yeah yeah so it'd be kind of weird right you know i, I could see where it could look weird if you put it, if you put the two pickups too close together yeah know? yeah but i think throughout history that's been done as well where you know like there's really no like for some people there's no useful tones behind you know behind a certain point um, on a base. Yeah, there, just, are, there are a lot of like, you know, like um, it's too bright. historic bases where the, you know, there's like two pickups right in the middle of the body. Yeah, but I mean, you're just saying like, if it's too close to the bridge, the sounds are too bright. Yeah, or maybe too muffled, you know, too too brittle and, and also quiet. Uh, huh. But I don't know. I think you know the jazz bass, the bridge pickup sounds great to me. Um, but I, you know, I generally blend in the neck pickup. Um, yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, that's a good. That asks, that's a good question. Then, so how are you gonna? What are the controls gonna be? How are you gonna connect the pickups together? Are you gonna, um, have, pitch or are you gonna have just two volume controls or something? So I bought um, stacked pots. So I'm going to, I'm going to have two knobs, two, you know, basically two sets of knobs. Um, so a jazz bass has three knobs. knobs. Yeah, four knobs, but they're, two of them are concentric. So, um, so I'll have volume and tone for each one. Because the, uh, the 51 style basically just has like two holes on the, on the control plate. Mm -hmm. Is the jack on the control plate too? Yes. Okay. Huh. Okay. So that's kind of cool. So it's, you're just gonna have like two volumes. So it'll be just, it'll just mix the two pickups together and then you have a tone control for each one. Yep. That sounds pretty practical. Very bass, like very, it's a very bass control system, you know, like a guitar player might not like that. They're like, I gotta have my switch, you know? Yeah. You know, I've, um, so I'm, I have, I have the jazz bass, you know, where if you, you've got like, two volumes of volume for each pickup and one master tone control. So this will be a little bit like that, except for that I'll have tone for each one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I also have a guitar that has two volume controls and one master tone. And it also has switches to, you know, to do coil splitting and stuff. But I, I played, I was playing it the other day and I realized having two volume controls on a Fender style guitar is a pain in the butt. I don't know why it's different on a on a Gibson guitar. Maybe I I understand it or I expect it, but um, 
I find that frequently, yeah, maybe it's the it's the layout because the it's a it's a jazz master shaped guitar, and so the the knobs are in a row. So the first one is the the neck pickup volume. The second one is the bridge pickup volume. So I just I I just kind of feel like I'm defaulting to the the neck pickup volume every time I'm trying to like get volume out of the guitar. Yeah. And that's that's kind of an issue. I think I'm going to change that. Yeah. I'm I'm the same way with the Jaguar. Like I love the Jaguar as a guitar, but the control system is like goofy weird. It's like it doesn't make any sense. We talked about it before, but like yeah. you know, just super confusing the way that you work the controls on the Jaguar, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's on a traditional Jaguar as well as on a yeah, you know, on, on yours is like a, I don't know, vintage modified or something. Yeah, I don't know what model it is. It's just the black one with the humbuckers, but like, and no tremolo, right? But but still, the controls are the same. So it has the three switches on the bottom, the switch on the top, and the two little roller wheels at the top, and the two knobs at the bottom, right? But like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, I mean, it makes sense when you understand it, but like, in a practical way sense like how you use it, it everything is different and it doesn't you know it's, it doesn't help you understand it or make it easier for you to play the instrument and use it right yeah i think probably more people have taped over the switches on uh, on jaguars than than have <laughs> yeah. really like you know championed those things yeah it would have been so much better with the three like they make some of them will have a three position switch for the switch at the bottom mm -hmm. right like that would be so much better because on mine and I, I complained about this before is like if you're strumming if you can hit the switch at the bottom it's a sliding switch and if you knock them both down it turns off both of those pickups so if you're in the the neck pickup zone and you knock the switch with your hand like and it's not hard to do i've done it before not often but every once in a while it just goes silent and then you're like wait what happened you know like you know, if it's a three position switch, it would just switch between one pickup or another, right? And then you're like, right. okay, I hit the switch, but it's still, I still hear something, you know? Right. Yeah, I had that happen on my my Mustang the other day or today, um, where I, you know, hit one of the switches part way, because that has the same kind of those little sliding yeah. selector switches. And um, I moved one part way and it was enough to like, you know, kill the signal. And I was, oh, yeah, yeah. If you, you put know, those in the middle, they're off. Yeah right? Which is kind of annoying, you know? Yeah. So I was like partway towards the middle. It wasn't even all the way. So, um, you know, so first, first thing I started looking at the pedal board. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you don't always know, out. you know, right. like you don't know what happened there. You're just strumming it out. Oh, silent shit. You know, you don't notice that you hit, hit the switch that can happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, so what are you working on this week? You got any, what's your, what's your project for the week? Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, start making some sawdust on that um on that base i'm gonna do it nice i'm gonna measure you know, it out and, and you know what i would it. you know what i would want to do is um is draw on the wood <laughs> you might maybe don't want to do this but but i would get the pencil out and i would just draw the lines like and sketch in like where i wanted to put the pickup and where the bridge is going to go and measure it all oh i'm totally going to do that i'm also um you might have to sand it all down afterwards though. Exactly. I have to sand it down anyway. So I might as well draw right on the wood. Um, so I'm going to do the, um, the, the routing, the routing um, before I do fine sanding or finish, of course. So, nice. so yeah, it's a good time to do that. I'm going to draw on it with a pencil. It's not going to leave any kind of a residue because it's yeah. going to have that Odie soil finish. Yeah. Well, what's cool about that is, is it'll give you an idea of like what it's going to look like and you could sit back and check it out and say like, hey, does that look right? You know, you could measure it too and check things out, you know? Yeah. How are you going to do, you're going to have to drill a hole from the pickup to the cavity. Yeah. Um, I got like a long drill bit I can loan you. It's like a two foot, it's like a quarter inch bit, but it's about two feet. 18 inches, two feet long. Yeah, I have a long enough bit. I, I'm just now I'm trying to remember how I how I was going to do that. I'm wondering if I might if I might have a jack hole on the side of the body. Um, I I'll have to look at it, but um, yeah. Um, 
there is a way. There's always a way. Hey, I got a question for you too. So do you have the two pickups? They're both mm -hmm. single coils, right? Yep. Are they both wound the same way or is one of them reverse wound? I believe they are reverse wound. That was the what... one of them's reverse. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That, that was what it said on, on the guy's website. Um, these are pickups that were made by um, uh, bootstrap pickups. Mm -hmm. Did you like the quality? Because those were pretty cheap. Like um, they look great. Um, I haven't plugged them in. I haven't used them on anything yet. So we'll we'll, we'll do a demo of it. And, um, oh, cool. And we'll I haven't about tried it. those, but the prices seem so good. Like, yeah. Yeah. And people on the forums have been pretty positive about it. So I think it's going to be all right. Um, yeah, cool. The one thing I would say about this guy, he's, he's not really great on like feedback. For about a month, I was wondering if I was going to get the pickups. And I knew that he was swamped, but you know, like he doesn't really like email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And eventually he, he emailed me because there was some, you know, like there was some issue with shipping. It was just bouncing around the Ohio area before it finally made it out of the state and towards me. Um, and I, you know, I got them with no problem. Um, but yeah, it's just like the it's kind of like that, that idea of, are you going to get the product you ordered from this guy? That's a little, a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of rough, you know? Yeah. Sorry. But at least the prices were so cheap. It, it's not a big loss, right? Yeah, exactly. If, if he never sent them to me, I wouldn't be like, you know? Yeah. Um, how, how much were they like 30 bucks or 50 bucks or something? Yeah. I think they might've been like 35 bucks. I don't know. I can't remember. That's so cheap. That's great. Yeah. And everybody, I remember reading a, um, a thread about these and they said they were like very, people liked them a lot, so. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I just decided they're, they're close enough. I would just show you what they look like. They're, you know, like, um, they're nicely waxed. They all, they use the cloth co covered, uh, um, wire um, and the flat work is really nice actually I think it probably says back here you know like what direction they're wound um, they say bootstrap pickups on them Palo Alto and then there's some some other stuff on here that I can't quite make out like maybe the strength or like you know how hot they're wound huh. but yeah they're pretty good yeah cool it looks super old school yeah yeah so they'll be really appropriate for the space yeah how are you going to mount them in the body just like a wood screw with a spring um i'm gonna have to wait and see they didn't come with wood screws they came with these um are you gonna have a pick oh wait yeah, I'm going to have a pick guard. Oh, so they can mount in the pick guard then? No, the pick guard doesn't touch the, um, the cavity. Oh. It, it comes right to the edge yeah. of the pickup cavity. And then the other one's right in the middle of, of the body. Hmm. I have some, uh, some of these brass, like threaded brass inserts. You could try that mount. You'd have to drill it out and then mount the threaded insert, and then you could put like a 440 screw into the insert, you know? So instead of threading into the wood with a wood screw, you'd just be screwing a machine screw into the brass insert. That could be really cool. Yeah, I have a few of those, I think in a drawer over here. So tell me if you wanna try those. I've tried them and they kind of work. It's a little bit of a hassle to get them mounted, you know, to screw them in straight because it's kind of hard to turn them. You gotta get another screw with a nut and you screw it into the brass insert and then you tighten the nut against it and then you turn the other screw with the insert attached to the end of it. Hmm. That makes any sense, yeah. right? Cool, okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll look into this when I, when I get closer to, to that. Yeah. So what are you gonna work on this week? Well, I'm trying to write another class. So we have the Range Master class 
And then I'm writing up a, a class number two that's like mods you can make to the range master. And I was hoping to have it done this weekend, but I'm not quite done yet. So I'm, I've, I got to work on that. Um, and I found some really great mods for the range master too. Like um, one of the mods is adding a gain control. And what I like about that is the range master is actually kind of gritty. Like it's kind of distorted. It says isn't really clean, but with the gain control, as you back off the gain, it cleans up. So you can kind of dial in the amount of grit that you want. It's kind mm -hmm. of a great, I think it's good. That was my favorite mod so far, you know? Um, and then I got some other ideas too, like other things you can do with a single transistor that'll go in that, in that article, right? Oh, cool. Okay. So um, I, I, I'm guessing like you get to like class three or something like that and you start stacking up transistors. Yeah, I'm going to do class three will be like two or more transistors. Like, what do you do? Class one and two is just like one transistor. And then I think class four, I'm going to get into the op amp. And but I'm going to start with this 386 chip, which is not really your standard op amp. It's kind of like a whole amplifier, like on a chip, you know, but it's cool. You can make a lot of stuff with the 386. There's like a lot of really cool projects. So um, so that's going to be coming up. Right. I just got to write it all You can take some pictures and you know, you know, I tried to build some stuff. I built, actually, I built the range master with the mods on my breadboard over here. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got it right here. You know, I got my breadboard here with all the parts on it, you know, yeah, I can't tilt it or all the parts will roll off because, you know, but uh, yeah, so I, I was kind of working on that and it was working out pretty good. So, you know, um, Anyway, so that'll hopefully be coming up. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up this big muff right here. So I got this thing almost done, you know. Right. Very good. Yeah. Well, you've been productive. Yeah, yeah, I gotta work. I was off of work, so it was easier to get stuff done, but now I'm in, I'm gonna start working again on Monday. So that's gonna take up time. Yeah, work, work does. It work sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Worth is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Should we sign off? Sure. Yeah. Um. And I think. Um. Well, come back next time. I think we're going to talk about um mod pedals. We're going to talk about Ooh, various yeah. different modulation pedals. Um. So. Um. So. Um. So definitely tune in for that. Um. We'll probably have some some demonstrations or some some good examples of, of of modulation pedals that um that you can build at home. Um, I can't build this one, but this is, a, yes. I just had one on my desk right here. So I just picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. And another movie, so. Um, yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what movie we're gonna talk about. We have to decide on that. Yeah, uh, if you have any ideas uh, of movies. Um, let us know. Yeah, let us know in the comments. Um, of course, we like to talk about movies that have a a great soundtrack or um yeah more more uh you know a score you know where the movie is scored in an in interesting way so um so that helps um but don't worry if you don't have any of your own ideas we'll have an idea by next week yeah okay cool we'll see everybody later thanks all right thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time yeah see ya